pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to TMAC's annual Transportation Innovation Breakfast. We are going to try, try, try our hardest to get through what we're going to get through in the next, well, by 9.30. Um, I do have a couple of things that I need to point out. Um, we, are, we, are, we are excited to bring these seasoned uh, veterans today to the table to talk about the future of 5G, uh, its infrastructure, and what does it mean to our communities. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to welcome, we have C Commissioner Elect Josh Maxwell with us. Josh? Thank you, Josh, for being with us. It, hopefully this is a regular attendee event for you on a, for with TMAC, so thank you for being here today. Um, we also do have, uh, from Representative Schusterman's office, we have representation from there, and we do have two East Whiteland supervisors, Sue and Rich, with us, so thank you very much for joining us today. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody else. When you start calling out names, it's one of the things that I always fear. They got everybody covered? Awesome. So um, first and foremost, um, we can't do projects like this without our, our key sponsors. And I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and our investors today. Um, our gold sponsors are McMahon Associates, Pannoni, Traffic Planning and Design, WSP. Our silver sponsors are Able Brothers Towing, Buckley, Brian, McGuire, Morris, Remington and Morris, or Remington and Vernick. That's Remington and Vernick, so thank you. Um, our bronze sponsors today are DVRPC, KCI Technology, Saul Ewing, Ernstine and Lair, TY Lynn International, and Workspace Property Trust. So thank you very much for your investment in TMAC. Um, if you would like to learn more about the benefits of, of sponsorship, and if you are not a member of TMAC, uh, there are some brochures on your tabletops, uh, please speak with John and I afterwards. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to serve all of you through our board of directors. Um, we have a great uh, board diversity. Um, yesterday I did send out the 2020 ballot to the main contacts of all of, all of our organizations, but we do have several of those uh, folks that are on the, on the uh, ballot that are here with us today. If those folks could please stand, just so that people can recognize you and talk to you. I know that we have more. There they are. So, so thank you so much. Um, now, for the reason that we came here today, um, and, and how this all started, was the conversation, what is 5G and what is it going to do for me? Because I hear it all over the place. So to take it back is, you know, we started with 1G. And I did bring props, and those that know, um, I was a history major, so I have a collection of stuff. Um, who had one of these? <laughs> Comcast was my carrier. Um, then I moved to this. Um, who had one of these? <laughs> okay. And then, and then mine came with a camera. Who had one of these? Okay. And the nifty little holder for it. And really, what did the antenna do? <laughs> and then we started to move into, well, smaller was better, right? And so then this became the 3G technology, two to 3G technology. And as I got older, bigger is better for me right now. Um, and so we've, we've moved to 4G, and the next generation is to, to 5G. Um, so to open up this conversation, I actually found an article yesterday, um, and it was two days old, and this is why we're here. Um, this was in the daily, it's called the Daily Pilot. 
It's out on the LA Times, so it's West Coast. Um, Laguna Council seeks to address residents' concerns as it considers new 5G related rules. During a nearly three hour hearing, we all love those, on possible municipal code amendments, we know we love those, uh, aimed at bringing Laguna Beach into compliance with federal rules, residents made one thing clear to the city council, they don't want 5G in their town. And it's really an understanding about what is 5G. Council members heard that message loud and clear and directed city staff Tuesday to examine and address residents' concerns, which included possible issues with noise, mandatory testing, warning signs, the Americans with Disability Act and Fair Housing Act. And I will put this in an email to everybody so that you can read it. And I have been saving this for a while. This is an article that was in the Wall Street Journal, the Saturday, Sunday edition on August 24th, um, where cities want 5G, but not like this. And the picture is showing uh, hundreds of cell towers that are in a community. And so this is another, I will put this link in the, in the message. So we've moved into a new generation of mobile apps ones that are data driven, ones that require ultra fast connectivity, and yes, GPS. And so, you know, how many people in this room have Netflix on their phone? How many people have some sort of music like Spotify on their phone? And how many have the Uber or Lyft app on their phone? Um, and then, you know, for, for us and what PennDOT tells us, you know, Waze is the program that we use. So who has Waze? And don't you get frustrated when you drive through somebody's neighborhood and you go, oh, they're driving through my neighborhood too. So this, the, the conversation is we continue to move towards what is called the Internet of Things. So, you know, when you go to your Home Depot, you can buy a thermostat, which is controlled by your cell phone. Or that lighting package. Oh, I forgot to change the time on the clock. Let me turn the lights on outside the house now. Or, you know, I don't need car keys. Let me just punch in the code into my phone and the garage or the door will open for whoever wants to have access to the house. And then, you know, it's the Uber Eats and the coffee maker that we all want on demand. So the internet of things. And as we move to more internet of things, we get more digital traffic. And the greatest example for this group for an internet of things is well, rush hour traffic where 202 and 76 meet. Um, and who likes going through that intersection? It's just everybody is trying to get through that segment. But as we talk about here in our office, the future of autonomous cars can't have, they can't have, I'm buffering right now. I can't get information that does not work for, for, uh, for cars, for autonomous cars. So 5G is designed to eliminate that traffic, to be more reliable and faster. And I have been told that as the, wa the, the, the wider bandwidths are being uh, deployed, that this system will be 100 times faster than what we're currently experiencing with 4G. And there is zero latency, which means that there is no buffering. I loved always that. I'm buffering, I'm buffering, especially when you're watching that movie. You push the play button, it happens. So, you know, in some of the remarks that I, that I was reading about is that, you know, this 5G becomes the multimodal environment built through the technology for our cell phones and our Internet of Things. And so there will be advances in the Internet of Things that we can't even think about today. You know, there will be advances in telemedicine. There will be advances in 
uh, automated vehicles, industrial robots. And one of the things that I have seen is that and read that Apple is not working to advance the iPhone 17 right now. They are beginning to invest in um, glasses, the technology of glasses, wearing those pieces, um, and that those glasses will give you that environment that the phone screen currently gives you. And so our speakers today that we're pleased to, to present to you um, are really individuals that are on the forefront of this conversation. This conversation is happening now, deployment is now. Um, our first speaker uh, to speak to us is Joe Fascuzzo. Um, he's the Senior Vice President and Director of Strategic Growth at Pannoni. And he's gonna share with us the 5G vision. What does it mean to be smart cities? What are the things that we're looking at for the smart cities? Followed that will be Gary May. He's the sales manager and project manager for Signal Services. And he's gonna provide us information on what the small cell solutions are for our communities, to think about those designs, that we can control those standards to the extent that we can in our communities so it fits them. And then rounding out our conversation is gonna be David Babbitt. He's the president of Babbitt and Associates and he is a, uh, he's with, with land planning consultants. He's gonna round out our conversation is what do we need to do to prepare our communities from the municipal code side of the equation? What are the things that we need to be aware of for this conversation? So each of these presenters will have a brief presentation. At the conclusion, we will then take all the questions. I will not be back up to the podium, so it is my, uh, my great pleasure to introduce Joe Fascuzzo as our first speaker. Joe, it's all yours. Morning, everybody. While well, uh, John is uh, queuing that up, as um, Tim said earlier, my title at uh, Pannoni is Director of Strategic Growth, Strategic Initiatives, and I've always loved innovation. And uh, the things that um, firms like ours are getting into, uh, we, we're using technology today that we didn't have available to us a year or two years ago, right? So, the, so the, uh, the, the world is changing very rapidly in our space. And I know there's a lot of engineers in the room and they, they can, uh, uh, I know that they will uh, you know, understand what I'm talking about when I say those type of things. Um, talk about the Internet of Things uh, also. Um, the, uh, and, I, and I travel around the country, talk a lot about the smart cities, uh, spend a lot of time with cities in, in every part of the, of the U.S. Um, in fact, we've got, uh, we just finished a, a, a worldwide study uh, building the hyper-connected city, city with ESI. Um, I, I was here a couple months ago when uh, Steve Ray spoke from ESI Consult in Philadelphia. They're presenting that study in Barcelona in uh, two weeks. Um, in terms of, of the hyper-connected city of the future. But you talk about the Internet of Things um, and, and what's connected in your home. Uh, you know, my washer's connected, my dryer's connected, my refriger refrigerator's connected, the, uh, my car has all kinds of things connected. And to me, the ultimate was uh, about uh, two months ago, uh, we rescued a cat about a year ago, and uh, my wife came home a couple months ago, and uh, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the little wind-up uh, uh, mice you put on the floor, wound it up, and the cat chased it around. Um, this particular mouse had to, I had to download an app uh, for my wife's phone, um, and, uh, uh, and then the mouse, uh, uh, the, the phone controlled the mouse, a real mouse, right, uh, on the floor. Uh, but as we, as we do um, all of these connections to the Internet of Things, um, there are uh, lots of issues that come uh, that come along with that in terms of uh, cybersecurity and in the in the uh, in the smart city space, a lot of people are worried about smart, uh, about cybersecurity. Uh, cities like, for example, Atlanta, uh, the city of Atlanta got breached um, by uh, the uh, HVAC controls. Right, the the uh, the back door um, to their systems was through the HVAC system because of smart controls. Uh, Tim just talked about smart thermostats. I put a smart thermostat in my house the other day. Every one of these things is a, is a breach or a potential breach, and cybersecurity will become more and more of an issue as, as we move into the, into the future. So John's like uh, still working away here, but that's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, and I was just down in Baltimore on Tuesday, and again, another con they, they just had a breach um, in Baltimore. Uh, you know that 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 cost them. We I know at at uh, Pannoni, uh, we back up our data every 15 minutes um, to avoid the cybersecurity issue. So, 
talk about technology. Yeah. <laughs> it's the internet. You want to use the, uh, you can use my, my uh, flash drive. Just, uh, is it angry? It's all working earlier today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. Looks like it's powering up. Here we go. See if that works. Which one are we using here? That one, yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. So, um, the fourth industrial revolution will be powered uh, with the launch of the 5G network. Um, I'm actually uh, working on an article right now, the industrial revolution versus the technolog technological revolution, right? And the, um, the difference between the two was obviously the industrial revolution lasted you know, uh, more than a century. Um, lots of great innovation with the industrial revolution. Um, we can you know, sit here and talk about a thousand things from the automobile to the airplane. Um, you know, and all the things that are out there that came, but it was a, it was long, long in the making. Um, and um, and uh, cities, uh, places, um, we, and, and by the way, I should say, when we talk about smart cities, let's, let's expand our minds and let's not just kind of, because when, I, when, when we, we started talking at Pannonia about smart solutions, right? So we don't want to limit ourselves to cities. Uh, college campuses need to be smart. Um, um, uh, uh, business parks uh, in the future will be smart. Um, uh, hospital campuses will be smart. Uh, so everything really is go going to have to move in, in. Businesses have to be smart. Individual businesses will have to be smart. Um, just like our own lives are becoming smarter. Uh, but the, the, um, the, the, the difference between the, the two is, you know, cities like Pittsburgh, for example, died with the Industrial Revolution because they didn't see the end of it coming. Um, that won't happen in the technological. If we don't see the technology, embrace the technology, and run with the technology, um, almost on a daily basis, then um, our businesses, our cities, our towns, our college campuses, whatever the case may be, um, they will uh, die. But it won't be a slow death, it'll be a very, very quick death. And as I say when I, when I travel around, there's an opposite to smart. And I don't think anybody wants to be on the opposite side of, of the word smart. So we all have to be sort of thinking about it in, in those pers uh, in, with that perspective. Um, I spoke at a conference at NJIT a couple weeks ago one of the things that I, that I took out of it, I thought that was, that was most interesting. So um, Uber, Lyft, um, Airbnb, none of those companies could have existed without 4G technology, right? So here we have three companies, um, Uber and Lyft being the largest taxi companies in the world without owning a vehicle. Uh, Airbnb being the largest um, hotel chain in the world without owning a hotel room, right? All were uh, developed and, and able to exist around 4G technology. So the question is, what technologies, what businesses are going to are going to be, are, are going to come about with 5G technology? We can't even sit here today and, and comprehend um, the kind of businesses that will come out of 5G uh, with all the things that Tim said in terms of how fast and quick um, data will move. So um, that that was very enlightening to me because we could sit around the room here and 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 you know Airbnb. Um, uh, just talking to one of our guys yesterday that just traveled to Italy, Airbnb um, was how he, how, how he traveled around Italy, um, uh, you know, in terms of hotel rooms, right? So here, here's three companies that we, we kind of think have been around forever, they haven't been, and they were not even a, a, available uh, without, the, um, uh, 5G tech, without the 4G technology. So um, with more than 30 billion connected devices by 2025, 5G will be the key, key enabler, big data, mobility, cyber, influencer, um, demographics, climate change, all of these things will wrap around uh, 5G technology. Uh, and, and again, uh, just keep, you know, keep that in the back of your mind as to what companies will, will come about that we don't even know about uh, today. <clears throat> okay, autonomous vehicles. It's not a question of people, you know, especially again, the engineers in the room. If I'd have rolled back the clock uh, five, six, seven years ago and talked about autonomous vehicles with a bunch of engineers, They'd had a thousand reasons why autonomous vehicles were, were impossible, weren't going to happen, because we tend to think too much, we think through the, uh, you know, all the problems, right? It's not a question of if autonomous vehicles now, it's a question of when autonomous vehicles. As we sit here today, 
Um, all great minds around the world are working on all the all of the issues that have to wrap around autonomous vehicles, and um, and will make them um, a fait accompli, please, right? So that by but, you know they could they could generate more data than the Earth's entire population does today, just with autonomous vehicles. Okay. Um, Remember that that uh, all autonomous vehicles will be electric, right? So, so we are going to make this switch. Uh, I think by 2025, 25 percent of our cars will be electric vehicles as we make that transition. Uh, I was on the phone this week with a company that has a uh, has the technology for a virtual traffic signal um, in uh, our cities, like a city like Philadelphia. 20 percent of the signals are uh, 25 20 percent of the intersections are signalized. The reason that the other 80% are not signalized, for the most part, has got to do with money, right? Because it's very expensive to signalize an intersection. This this company has already come up with a virtual traffic signal that'll basically uh, the technology will be inside your car and it will it will warn you stop. You need to stop here in an unsignalized intersection. That to me is again the the precursor or the technology that will exist between now and the and the deployment of autonomous vehicles. So it's really not a question of of uh, um, if autonomous, autonomous vehicles, it's really a question of when, and um, and they will happen. And um, you know, cities like the you know, there's there's already autonomous buses running the Vegas Strip. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh has autonomous vehicles, you know, going in every direction. So um, uh, we just finished a project uh, for New Brunswick, New Jersey, on the deployment of sensors. They're using it as an as an economic development tool. Um, they're going to develop their downtown. Uh, they're going to incubate businesses. They're going to give away the data for free. Uh, with sensor technology, again, not possible without 5G. So the 5G deployment is going to be a key part of, of making all that possible. But for them, it's an economic development play, right? Again, going back to what I said earlier, if you're not smart, you're the opposite of smart. If you're the opposite of smart, you're not going to attract the, the, um, the, you know, the businesses of the future. If you don't attract the business of the future, you're not going to attract the, the, um, the, the workers of the future. And if you don't tr attract the workers and the businesses of the future, then, you're, then your city, um, you know, or again, going back to what I said before, extrapolate that out, college campus, hospital campus, whatever the case may be, um, you will not, um, you know, attract the talent and, and, and folks that you need. Um, obviously, current mobile networks don't have the speed, and we talked about, Tim talked about latency, so. Um, 5G will make driverless cars, uh, uh, cloud-connected um, traffic control, other applications. When uh, Gary comes up, I'm sure he'll be talking from signal service. He'll talk about you know, kind of what's happening in that whole uh, realm of traffic signals themselves and the interconnection of, of uh, signals, um, again, that needs to happen. Vehicle-to-vehicle <clears throat> um, vehicle is what's called V2X, right? Um, the key technology uh, for 5G deployment is getting the vehicles to talk to each other. So vehicle-to-vehicle, vehicle-to-signal, uh, signal to an ITS system, all of these interconnections and, and movement of data all very, very important uh, to, to the rollout of the, um, uh, you know, of, of um, autonomous vehicles and, and kind of going in that direction. And I don't want to make the whole thing sound like uh, my talk is, is, you know, is wrapped around sort of the, you know, why, um, uh, you know, that part of the conversation, but 5G is going to be uh, used for many, many, many more things beyond, um, uh, uh, you know, vehicle communication, right? So, uh, you know, that goes without saying. And then I said before, 20% uh, of the global cars um, will be uh, electric cars by the year 2025. I had to scratch my head on that, and I think it was actually, Tim, at one of your things here where I, where I kind of heard that all electric vehicles would be, um, all autonomous vehicles would be electric vehicles, and I hadn't really thought of that before, but obviously an autonomous vehicle isn't going to go to the Wawa and fill up with gas um, on its own, so that's why they all have to be electric. And I think um, my last slide here, um, and then one I want to spend a little bit of time on, um, so this whole idea, I, th I think this is where we're going to be hung up, right? Um, for those that of us that were around, uh, I spent a lot of my time, I am a civil engineer, I spent a lot of my time about around the uh, approval entitlement process, um, getting municipal approvals. Um, you, you just heard uh, Tim talk about Laguna Beach and the problems out there. Um, those of us that went through the rollout of cell towers and how they were such a problem, nobody wanted them in their neighborhood. Um, until municipalities realized there was a revenue stream um, and that they could uh, have the cell towers themselves and then all of a sudden it became much easier for a cell tower deployment, right? But we all understand today that cell towers were, a, a, you know, a, a necessary evil for us to be able to communicate with our cell phones. Um, unlike cell towers, 5G towers are much smaller, but you need many more of them, right? 
And um, so there's going to have to be a, uh, the street right away is the best place for them. And I think this is going to be, this is the headbutt. This is the headbutt between, the technology already exists. 5, 5G is not a technology of the future. It already exists. The rollout of the technology will be the problem. And how our municipal governments are going to um, uh, interact. I know there's some you know, attorneys in the room, and we know that um, legislation has been passed at state levels uh, so that local municipalities will not be able to um, stop the deployment, but it's still going to be a problem. Um, but uh, as I see it, the, the, you know, the real problem goes back to what I said earlier, that if we're not, the municipalities that resist it the most, right, um, are the ones that are going to be left behind. Um, it's really hard for me to be, you know, to believe like, a, you know, California, you think is going to be so forward thinking and, the, and yet they're, um, you know, they're fighting uh, the deployment. But I mean, I get it. There's going to be a lot of antennas. They're going to be in the right of way. Um, and um, uh, I think the same thing that we did with cell towers where we learned to hide them in church steeples uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, fake trees. Um, all of the things that we did around cell towers, I think the same thing will happen with the 5G deployment. And I think um, Gary will touch a little bit on that uh, when he comes up. So I think we're gonna hold um, questions to the end, Tim? Yes. Yeah, so with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to, uh, to Gary, I guess, is, uh, to talk about uh, from Signal Service. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Gary May from Signal Service, and uh, we represent Valmont Industries. And um, Valmont is a manufacturer of structures that typically go in the right of way, uh, traffic signal structures, um, sign structures, lighting structures, and they're also a manufacturer of uh, communication structures for utilities. So they're familiar with cell towers and the traditional deployment. Um, we've become involved a lot with the small cell uh, technology and 5G deployment because, as Joe said, they're Antennas are getting smaller. Uh, the right away is a important area to deploy small cell because of all the connectivity we want while we're driving anymore, and it's just become a key uh, a key deployment for the carriers. So, so small cell sites. What are they? Traditionally, you know, they're sites that provide carriers access for wireless networks for 3G, 4G, and 5G. The, tr tr the traditional sites are usually large towers that they're called macro sites. Um, they provide the carriers, multiple carriers on one tower, cover large areas of three miles or larger, and uh, high power radios of 40 watts or larger. And we all, we've all seen these sites. Small cell sites are like macro sites, they're just scaled down. Um, small cell sites typically will be a single carrier and will cover an approximate area of about a thousand feet and they'll use lower power radios. So why do we want to go to small cell? Um, the towers cover wider sites. They're, the pros for towers are they cover large areas for carriers and that makes them efficient and expensive and easy to maintain. The problem with these macro sites are the spectrum is limited and throughput gets limited. Uh, they provide poor signal coverage in, in uh, the outer regions, the margins of the, the uh, coverage area. And as more mobile users connect up, throughput and speeds decrease. Macros also have a lot of uh, coverage holes due to buildings, trees, and, uh, and mountains, as we all know. So small cell, 3G, 4G, 5G, what's the difference? So uh, 3G, we used to get up to, you know, 400 kilobytes per second, and it's been replaced by 4G technology, which is what we're all using now. So 4G technology will get you up to 100 megabytes per second. Um, it uses a licensed wireless frequency, 600 to 2100 megahertz, um, provides good throughput, 5 to 15 megabytes per user, but it's poor compared to what we get in our offices and our homes on a wired broadband. Uh, doesn't cover the same area as 3G as meaning that we need more tower sites to deploy 4G. Um, the difference is 4G also uses higher power radios as I've mentioned which is usually a radio with an external antenna mounted on the tower. The radio is actually in the building that you see at the base of the antenna tower. 
5G networks were being promised up to 10, up to 10 gigabytes per second, which is comparable to what we would get um, in our offices and our homes with hardwired broadband. Um, throughput of one gigabyte per user, um, and it uses a higher frequency radio, 26 to 39 gigahertz, and it covers a thousand, mile, a thousand foot radius and uses an integrated antenna where the radio and the antenna are smaller and compact in one unit. So the FCC put out a ruling to accelerate deployment and to remove some barriers for the carriers to, to as again, to accelerate deployment. Uh, they limit application fees, they limit uh, yearly recurring fees, and the FCC established shot clocks for municipalities to respond to applications. The FCC also put out some um, guidelines for aesthetic requirements um, that cell sites deployed on poles be reasonable, no more burdensome than what is existing infrastructure, and that a municipality must have clearly defined standards that are published in advance. The deadline to publish, unfortunately, was amended to April 12, 2019. So if you don't have a standard now by the FCC, the carrier technically can come in and dictate what they want. But my opinion is most carriers want to work with their municipalities. So if you get ahead and create a standard, I my experience is most carriers aren't going to fight you with on that standard or when you create it, as long as it's in place by the time they're coming to your municipality. Um, the FCC also defines small, uh, small wireless facilities, uh, 50 foot or less, including their antennas, uh, no more than 10% taller than adjacent structures, um, provided some antenna sizes less than three cubic feet, and support equipment uh, sizes of less than 28 cubic feet. So we'll look at some small cell sites that, that have been deployed. Um, there's a couple different ones. There's the equipment attached directly to poles. Uh, typically it's unesthetic to the public. Exposes the equipment to uh, damage, whether it's intentional damage or just natural damage. And it's generally undesirable. Um, there's another type which is uh, shroud mounted. Um, it's more aesthetic to the public. It protects the equipment from weather and damage and uh, typically has a better look to it than, than just the equipment mounted to the side of the poles. There is a uh, dual use small cell site, which is basically um, a structure or a pole that is already being used for lighting, traffic structure, uh, a lighting structure, traffic signal structure, or anything else that's not originally a small cell site. Um, typically, you want to match it to existing design standards which is because it's in the right of way. Um, mostly it's going to be PennDOT's design standards. And small cell components can be either mounted in a shroud, in a cabinet, or in a structural base. So here's some examples of dual use small cell. Uh, the pole way on the, to, the, to your left is, is a typical decorative pole modified for small cell. Um, on the top is a shrouded antenna. And on the bottom is what we call structural base, which is actual, it's not a decorative base, but it's, it's been designed to support the loading of the pole and everything above it and house the, uh, the equipment for the small cell antenna. Um, this middle one is more of a traditional highway type lighting pole with a pole mounted cabinet and a shroud on the top to hide the antenna. And the one on the right is a more contemporary type uh, a structure with the same. Typically what you'll see is the cabinet is, is mounted behind this banner to hide the, uh, the equipment and the top shroud is a lot bigger. The difference is, um, as you see the smaller shrouds are 4G deployment antennas and the larger shroud is typical of a 5G deployment antenna. Uh, the difference between, uh, what I want to say is um, there are a lot of deployments for small cell already existing with 4G antennas. And the 4G antenna is typically what we call a cantenna. It's a, typically a round antenna. Looks like a big coffee can mounted to the top of the pole. 
there's not a lot of 5G deployments yet in our region. The 5G deployment, the antenna is more of a pano antenna. It's not rounded. And to get the coverage, the carrier will use, typically use three or four antennas mounted to the pole facing in different directions. It's kind of hard to see in the shroud, but you can see the shroud has a flat point on it for the panel antenna. Uh, there's single-use small cell sites, which are just dedicated to small cell, doesn't have any other lighting or anything else uh, mounted on it. It can be a standard design or it can be a decorative design to match aesthetics. Um, it can be, equipment can be integrated in the pole or it can be attached to the pole. Um, you have to be careful that if you're going to use existing poles or existing design standards that you do check them to make sure that they, they meet the loading requirement and the design standards to attach the small cell equipment. Uh, here's some examples of single use. It's basically a decorative pole to match an aesthetic with a uh, side mount cabinet and a antenna on the top of the pole for the, uh, a, a shroud for the antenna on top of the pole. And then there's a concealed pole. The concealed pole is a, uh, is a pole where all the small cell equipment is, is mounted inside of the pole. It's designed with structural, thermal, and specific accesses per the uh, small cell industry standards. Uh, it can, be, um, can have lighting. It can be a dual use pole. It can have lighting or it can have signals. Um, it can be, have fully integrated power, fiber panels, radios, and antennas. Or it can have uh, limited integrated where some things are mounted on the outside of the pole. So here's a typical example of a concealed pole. Usually you have a utility meter, AC power load centers for, the, for uh, power, and you have your fiber termination panels. And it's all kind of concealed inside of the pole, and you have the top shroud for your antennas, and you can see those are typical of 5G antennas um, with the panel antennas you can see out there. Here's some examples of fully concealed poles. Um, these are, as Joe said, there's the tree pole there. Uh, there's, this pole looks like a cactus. These are things that can be, can be done. Here are some concealed poles in the right of way, what we're more used to seeing. Um, you know, there's a sign that's concealed as an antenna pole. There's a couple of lighting structures that are also small cell poles that have been adapted for small cell equipment. This is the, uh, the banner. It's just an idea to conceal the cabinet. Um, typical lighting pole with a top shroud for the antenna. And again, notice that's a 4G antenna because it looks like a giant coffee can. Uh, pole mounted enclosure is a more industrial look. And this is just to give you guys an idea of all the different offerings that you have available or what the carrier might come to you guys with. A structural base where you know the support equipment is mounted inside of the base of the pole. Again, another example of a top shroud. These are our uh, 5G top shrouds because you can see the panel antennas in the shroud. Uh, more shrouds uh, adapted to lighting, traffic signal pole, and the typical utility pole. You also have options of uh, internal divisions in the pole, depending upon how you do business with your carrier. Um, if you're doing a, a, a pole with a lighting or traffic signal on it, you may want to have compartments inside the pole dividing up the different uh, wiring, uh, what belongs to the municipality and what belongs to the carrier. Another example of, of wire, channel wire dividers installed in a pole. Uh, some examples of structural cabinets, kind of show you all the equipment and how the cabinet's done and, and mounted to the bottom of the pole. Um, breakaway considerations, because we're in the right of way. These poles can be designed for breakaway. Um, it's just something that, that you have to know that is available. Here's some uh, real life applications. Um, we saw these earlier, but these are in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the DC National Mall. 
And they want to adapt this type of historic lighting pole. Uh, Silver Springs, Maryland, you can see the, the decorative pole on the left and the different variations of trying to adapt a uh, small cell for that. Uh, Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is interesting because they like this, uh, they like their poles, their poles are traditionally uh, concrete. So how do you, you can't really put a small cell on a concrete because the wire raceway in the concrete isn't, isn't big enough for the equipment. So what they did was they did a uh, kind of a rock covering on top of the outside of the pole. Uh, New Orleans, a stop sign pedestal that's adapted for a small cell. Uh, Roosevelt Island, New York, uh, more decorative lighting poles that are adapted for a small cell. And uh, locally, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, Philadelphia has basically come out with their standard, which is a traffic signal D pole. So anything in the city of Philadelphia for 4G or 5G is put on a traffic signal D pole. And I think to date, we've probably had 800 uh, poles have been ordered for Philadelphia. And that's just the tip of the iceberg is what our feelings are. And that's it. And I'll uh, pass it along to David. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Babbitt. I'm a land planner, one of only a few land planners in the room. Most of you are engineers or municipal officials. That's OK. Um, while we get this teed up, it's been my role to talk about the nexus between the technology and the municipal ordinances. How do we get these deployed? How can we uh, regulate them without being onerous? And how can we avoid problems with the carriers? Almost there? Ah, OK. Uh, I think we need to start with the legal landscape. As Gary mentioned earlier, uh, we've been dealing with this issue for a long time. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 started this process. Um, it's obvious that you can't effectively prohibit cell phone service. You can't discriminate between providers. Uh, citing decisions are made by local and state governments. And providers can address significant gaps in the coverage uh, through the least intrusive means. Um, in the early 90s, we all dealt with the, the, the big cell phones. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Things have changed, however. The um, third order and report in order, the small cell order, it's called 2018, um, municipalities cannot materially inhibit uh, develop, uh, development and deployment. Fees obviously have to be reasonable, can't be uh, punitive, and they can't be windfalls. You can't make tons of money off of these fees. The aesthetic controls must be spelled out, and they have to be reasonable, and of course there's the shot clock. And we're not talking about basketball, but the idea here is that municipalities have to deal with these applications in a timely fashion. Uh, 60 days for a co-location application, 90 days for a new facility, that's a strong incentive for co-location. The Pennsylvania Wireless Broadband Co-Location Act of 2012 uh, some of this has actually been superseded by the FCC shot clock order, but applications for co-location have to be handled administratively. They don't go through the land development process. They have to be handled just by staff. Failure to act within 90 days is a deemed approval. Those of you who are in municipal government know what that is. It's to be avoided at all costs. And then there's a state house bill that was introduced by a Bucks County representative in 2019 that addresses the issue of small cells in the right of way. It maintains local authority over siting. Uh, it includes provisions for historic districts, for decorative poles, for underground utilities. It's quite comprehensive. It establishes uniform fees. Obviously, they have to be in compliance with the federal rules. And it's still pending. There is some question as to whether it will be uh, enacted this year or next. It might have to be reintroduced next year. It's still not a done deal. The upshot of all this is to show that the federal and the state governments have made it clear that the provision of wireless services is something that's positive, not onerous, not to be hindered, not to be, uh, you can't put up obstacles for the deployment of this service. So how do you deal with it on a local level, all right? Um, 
the biggest thing I think we've discovered here is that there's a huge difference between uh, the photographs don't come through. Here we go. Between the macrocytes, which you will see eventually on the left, or maybe not, and the small cells. By the way, has anyone ever seen a small cell? Not that many of you. Really? Okay. Does anybody know, by any chance, if there are any small cells in East Whiteland Township, which is where we're sitting right now, other than the East Whiteland supervisors? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There are about six of them. They were put in, I think, earlier this year along Route 30. They're on the south side of the road. They're on existing utility poles. They're the cantenna type um, that Gary mentioned. Unless you're looking for them, you won't see them. The point here is that these are not the towers of yesteryear. Uh, we still don't have the macro site. The macro site is the, is the, you know, the 150 foot tall lattice tower or monopole we all know them, we all use them, we've all seen them, nobody likes them, they look like crap, right? That's the biggest complaint. No one wants to look at these things. They're gonna destroy my property value. You, they're gonna give cancer to all my children. These are the complaints we've heard. And by the way, there's very scant evidence for both of those notions. But it's true, they don't look good. They don't look great. They're not going anywhere. There are gonna be more um, macro sites developed, but fewer, I would suggest. And the whole notion is one macro site is going to work together with about 100 or 400, however many small cell sites under that macro site umbrella. They're going to work as a comprehensive system. But because they're shorter, because they're concealed, because they're lower power, and they do not necessarily have any known health effects, there is really not any uh, uh, longer any reason to oppose them. In fact, just the opposite. I would argue that there's every reason to support them and encourage them to be deployed in municipalities. So that brings us to the question, who needs zoning? Everybody. All municipalities in Pennsylvania that have zoning, I think, need zoning for both macro sites and small cells, but the two aren't the same. You can lump them in the same ordinance, in the same section of your code, but they are very different provisions. The themes here are that we have to balance between, on the one hand, permission, and on the other hand, regulation. Uh, you can't over-regulate small cells. You can't effectively prohibit them. Uh, the municipality in California uh, that was mentioned early on, in, in my view, that's, that's just a shame. To me, that's a, an issue of public education. These people need to be educated because what they're thinking, what they're being told, I think, is that 5G means we're going to have these 150-foot monopole towers on every block in front of everyone's house, and that's just not true. Um, the changing characteristics of the technology we've heard about, what's there today is not likely to be there in two or three years, and the legal landscape also changes, uh, in part because of the changing landscape. All zoning regulations have to comply with state and federal regulations, and uh, they have to keep up to date because those regulations keep changing. All right, the biggest question is where and how. I believe that small cells, small cell antennas should be permitted in every zoning district in every municipality. Every zoning district, no exceptions. Um, the industry has come up with these small cells mostly as a way to increase capacity. However, the two byproducts are there's a much less visual intrusiveness and much lower uh, um, power rating, so therefore there's, a, there's no impact on health. So uh, the vast majority of the small cells are going to be in the right of way. So the question becomes why, what interest is it for a municipality to inhibit small cell development? Does it make sense to deprive people or businesses in entire zoning districts of the ability to have high quality wireless service? I would argue the answer to that is no. According to state and federal regulations, you can't materially inhibit wireless service to begin with. So at least the recommendation, we should permit small cells in every zoning district. <clears throat> so if you permit them by right, if they are co-located, which means on an existing facility or more than one uh, uh, carrier on a tower, that's a strong incentive uh, for co-location. That essentially results in fewer facilities, fewer towers. Um, Permitting small cells by right means that applicants need to apply for a zoning permit, which is an administrative affair, and not go through the lengthy and timely 
um, uh, time consuming uh, and costly process of the land development approvals. Um, zoning permits are purely administrative, they're handled by staff, there's no night meetings, no hearings, it's quick, it's relatively inexpensive, there may be other permits required, building permits, right-of-way licensing agreements, franchising agreements and so forth, but these are all administrative as well. Uh, you can permit new poles or what are called substantial changes to existing poles um, by conditional use or by special exception and for those of you who are uninitiated, Special exception and, con and uh, conditional use are two mechanisms that require hearings at the local level, one with the zoning hearing board, the other with the board of supervisors or the elected officials. They are considerably longer, more costly, more involved, and a tremendous disincentive to having new facilities, a, tr a tremendous incentive to put uh, facilities on existing poles. Uh, I would also note that conditional use or special exception would need to occur within the shot clock. So you still have to keep on your toes and move things forward. Some regulations to avoid, we've seen some ordinances that permit small cell towers only in non-residential districts. I think that's a bad idea. Again, you're depriving people who live in all of your residential districts, which are the vast majority of the land in most municipalities, from the benefits of wireless service. Um, we've seen uh, ordinances permit small cell towers at intersections only. Well, what happens if you're in a suburban setting and you might have 1,500 feet between your intersections? That means there's going to be a gap, uh, and that's uh, just not necessary. Um, we've seen uh, ordinances that permit low antenna heights, something like 20 or 25 feet. Well, we think that's a mistake too. It essentially means you're going to have more antennas. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. So I'm not going to get into a great deal of detail, but ordinance elements obviously would include a purpose section, the purpose being to permit small cell wireless facilities, creating public benefits of service, preventing interference with the use of streets and sidewalks, minimizing the visual intrusiveness and all the fun things in life. Um, it would include a definition section, what would a zoning ordinance be without definitions. It would include terms like small wireless facility, co-location, utility pole, substantial change, all the, all the fun terms that need to be defined. It would have design requirements, such as location. Location would be, by and large, in the right-of-way, typically between the street and the sidewalk. Uh, minimum distance from intersections, a minimum inter uh, distance from driveways, not directly in front of storefront windows, for example. Uh, there would be a height limit, somewhere probably between 35 and 50 feet. Uh, the equipment box, typically located lower down on the pole, would have its own width, height, and size requirements color and appearance, there would be a requirement to make these essentially look like an integral part of the pole, whatever type of pole it is, utility pole, street light pole, uh, signal pole. There'd be no signage, no lighting, no advertising. I believe there is a requirement that you have to have a little label on each facility such that in case of an emergency, if somebody uh, climbs a pole because there's a fire, uh, that person will know whose uh, equipment it is. There'd be performance standards, can't interfere with streets, driveways, and sidewalks can't cause radio interference, you can't interfere with other utilities on the same pole, cable, TV, electricity, telephone, of course. Uh, it has to comply with the applicable building codes, electrical codes, health codes, safety codes, it has to comply with everything. And the process of approval, whether it's administrative or requires conditional use or special exception, you'd have to uh, state the time limits very clearly. You'd have to include the plan requirements, what's in, uh, required for a submission. Uh, it would permit the consolidation of applications into large batches uh, to expedite approval. Uh, I was involved in one um, batch of um, uh, applications in a municipality in eastern Montgomery County. I think there were something like 26 all handled in one application. Um, most of these are going to be on major corridors. Uh, so therefore, a, uh, a carrier rather would very likely choose to do the entire corridor once. Uh, the fees would be spelled out. They'd have to be according to the state and federal limits, of course. And then uh, the annual fees are limited to, I think, about $270 per pole. The application fee is limited to about $100 per antenna on an existing structure or $1,000 per antenna for a new utility pole. And finally, there'd have to be abandonment and removal provisions, what happens when this technology is no longer in use and everything is satellite-based or some other technology that we haven't even dreamed of at this point. Uh, in, in closing, I'd like to say that the 
Macro towers aren't going anywhere. Small cells don't work everywhere. They're not good for certain applications. For example, they don't do well for high-speed, high-volume expressways. So 202, Schuylkill Expressway, Blue Route, Turnpike are still going to need the macro sites. That's just a fact of the technology at the moment, as far as I know. That might change in a few years. I suppose we all hope it does. But small cells are going to fill in the gaps everywhere else. They're going to be what is uh, uh, the, the method of connecting to the internet and connecting to the system for almost all uses other than high speed, high volume roadways. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, I guess, along with the other two presenters. Wow, I remember this. You guys are good. We even got ourselves back on the schedule. Yep. is that they can go on buildings, but if they go on buildings, the people and the companies in those buildings don't get that service. So if it goes on one building, it can be pointed at across the street and the service will be provided there, but you can't just stick a, a facility on the top of an apartment building, the people in that building won't receive that service. Um, and I would also suggest that there are certain buildings on which these facilities should not be put. Single family detached homes, for example, biggest example. Um, for traffic lights, municipalities obviously own the traffic lights. So, are these companies willing to pay fees to the municipality to co-locate on a traffic signal? Yes, yeah. and many do. And is PennDOT does that require a traffic signal permit to be revised to allow that? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. There's probably 25 people in this room who do. <laughs> does anybody know? Anyone know yeah. the answer? And think you, you said, yeah. uh, you, uh, Gary said people working yeah. at PennDOT on that. PennDOT covers it in their HOP um, guidelines. So any small cell deployment in the right of way is basically an HOP application. And it's handled as an HOP application. But and if there's a current traffic yeah, today, right. and they want to come and co-locate on that, does that require any PennDOT's permit change? Yeah, it does. it does. It requires an HOP application. And that, because it's not just for the traffic signal anymore. It's actually an application for a small cell. Sorry. Is that only on a PennDOT road or is it the township road? It's PennDOT defines that as it in the right of way. So I don't really understand. I don't know if that covers a township road. I know it definitely covers a PennDOT. Well, PennDOT regulates all signals. So yeah, like even if the municipality owns a signal, they regulate it. So, right, and keep in mind a traffic structure, just because they want to locate it on a traffic structure, doesn't mean the traffic structure is capable of supporting the small cell equipment. So as an example, um, up in Wilkes-Barre, they had a couple traffic structures where they wanted to uh, put small cell equipment on. And basically, the, the carrier has purchased all new replacement traffic structures for that that are designed not only to PennDOT standards, but their additional loading for small cell equipment. So to understand traffic structures, PennDOT has a maximum load requirement for a traffic signal structure that must be designed for, even if it is holding one signal, the maximum load for that structure might be four signals, that's what it has to be designed for. PennDOT's opinion is anything you add to that is additional loading that the structure doesn't cover. So that design has to be checked for. Um, we've provided new poles to support small cell equipment, and we've also done engineering checks um, on poles that Valmont has manufactured to, to um, satisfy engineering requirements to, to support that the, uh, the poles support further loading for small cell equipment. Chris, going back to your original, that's why the, the, the towers are, are like, they're directional. That's why if you put on a building, you're going to block things, right? So being on a pole, you're going to get that free, free 360 degree kind of. Uh, Could you get developers to pay for the new upgraded traffic signals that was support 5G, or not maybe developers, the, the companies, the carriers. So instead of having a developer have to come in and build a new traffic signal, they partner up with these 5G carriers and say, okay, use the type of traffic signal to support our technology, and they'll pay for it. The 
carrier is paying for it now. The, the, so that, uh, that's, that's yeah, they, if they were going to want to locate, they were going to have to do some kind of, you know, can't expect the municipality to cover that cost, right? All of the polls that we provided have been paid for by the carrier. There's been no municipality or, uh, or developer actually paying for it. It's been developers working for the carrier. Then I think there's going to be, I mean, the, the one thing too, I think that we have to keep in mind is, this, is that this is the future, right? So we should start thinking about this in terms of, of you know, new traffic signals that are going in, new street lights that are going in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you said these are single carrier, so if we have multiple carriers come in, we're going to have to have multiple versions, multiple poles. How does that work? They, they can be for multiple carriers. I had a few examples where they were for multiple carriers. The problem with multiple carriers is it just adds more loading to the pole. The other thing is you have to get an agreement with the carriers. You know, the carriers are all looking for the best place in the right of way to get their coverage. So, the key is which we haven't figured out yet, is are you going to get two carriers to cooperate on one pole? In other words, you're sharing a house with your competitor. Not only are you sharing a house with the competitor, how do you come to agreements of paying for that house, paying for the permit, paying for the equipment, and who's going to maintain all that at this point? And then if we have one put it in and a year later somebody else comes in and we don't have control over where they put it, we could have another pole 40 feet away. Well, I think what David says is you, you do have to control where they put it. And I think... We haven't found that to be entirely true. Okay. <laughs> um, I think, you know, in the benefit of having less poles, it is, it is a good idea to, to try to get the carriers to co-locate all in the same pole so you have less... Should we try to write some ordinance that says if there's an existing pole, anybody coming in second has to share? I don't see why there isn't a reason you can't do that. Yes. Uh, PennDOT, right, and PennDOT, Absolutely. and basically PennDOT's HOP guidance says that PennDOT encourages a carrier to first use existing structures. And if they are going to apply for an HOP to install a new structure, part of that application has to, they have to have some proof that they've tried to co-locate on an existing structure and that's just not possible. Yeah. They, they can't just apply to say, I want to put a new pole here, they have to show you evidence that they can't use an existing structure. You see the gap, if, if what you're saying is correct, and I'm, I'm putting a pole in, put my antenna on it, and it cost me you know, $10,000 to replace that structure because of wind loads. The next carrier comes in and says, I'm going to require you to be on that same pole. Now that pole doesn't meet the wind load requirements. Would take, tear down a brand new pole a year later for another one. The carrier may do that. There, there's money to be made for these carriers. Yes. There's, they, you know, each the, each one of those poles for Philadelphia is four thousand dollars a piece, and the carriers are paying. That's not even the equipment that goes on those poles. It it is an issue because remember again, does it go back to in, in the municipal world when they rolled out? You know, there were really two cable companies that were buying for for. Uh, <laughs> municipal control, you know, to get first in, 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 each, or, in, in each municipality, um, whether it was Comcast, uh, Lenfest, you know, uh, uh, or Verizon, right? But, but the problem is there are multiple, I mean, we were talking about T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, um, you know, AT&T, there are multiple carriers in this. So, it, so it's something that, again, you want to be, I think as Dave said, you want to be proactive in the, in the, in the ordinance, right, and start to get ahead of this, uh, because there are a lot of carriers out there, but Gary said there's money, you know, there's not, they're not doing it for free either. How do we pre-plan to uh, design structures for new sites now that will then accept uh, the new 5G uh, utility structures? You know, we're, we're, we're sort of, how do we advise our clients? How do we you know, get involved with the design that's happening now with the, with the, you know, the onset of this new technology? To well, I think you need to see what your clients are interested in and what type of municipality or, or region of the municipality it is. I mean, some of the rural areas, a wooden utility pole, which is really what PennDOT is pushing you to do first, is, is not, is not unpleasing to the eye. I mean, it's, it's common to see that. 
but sometimes when you get a, a decorative region or a downtown region where you spend a lot of money on aesthetics, you don't want a carrier coming down and plopping four or five utility poles right in the middle of your, your downtown and you just, you just upgrade. I think the important thing is PennDOT does offer, you have to adhere to PennDOT's guidelines for design first in the right of way if it's a lighting pole or if it's a signal pole. So you have some things as a basis to start with. But on top of that, I think, as David says, you have to think about what you want for your municipality and write those ordinances to cover that. So if it's a downtown decorative region, you may want to start writing ordinances to co-locate, have carriers, multiple carriers co-locate on one pole, to have a design in place that has multiple antennas so that you're ahead of that game, so that when that carrier plops that pole down, you know it'll carry additional loading for antennas. And the reason is if you get ahead of these with these ordinances, as, as David points out, the, it becomes an administrative thing at that point and not, not a special consideration, not something you have to have meetings over or, you know, so. So we, so we can, some of the conversations in, in my readings is that we begin to deploy the 5G infrastructure before the technology is actually rolled out into the poles. So we can spend the time building out the infrastructure and then when 5G does roll out into our communities, the poles are ready to accept that because they're... That, yeah, your infrastructure is ready to accept it and then you're not, you're not basically um, giving in to what the carrier says they're going to do because you have these plans and these ordinances in place. And it's a hard, you know, how you design is a hard question because every, every municipality is going to have something different that they want if it's, if it's downtown. So. Now, I'm kind of speaking uh, specifically about the campuses that, that Joe spoke about, uh, medical, uh, education, uh, uh, town centers, for example, things where you know design is completely integrated and we're planning those things now. So, uh, you know, familiar with the Valmont company and product lines and, you know, should we be interfacing with Valmont to say, you know, here's our here's our predicament, how do we pre-plan for this this rollout? Yes. I mean those are the services we're offering now. I mean we're doing something now with the consultant working for Jacobs at Rowan University in southern New Jersey where they want to deploy 5G on the campus and their decorative traditional looking poles. And actually, the solution is one of the, it looks like one of the poles that we had are two decorative acorns coming off the side of the pole and we just extended the pole higher to put the antenna and the equipment on top. Um, we do renderings, we've done engineering for, for the consultant to show that it'll support all those loading. I mean, basically, we're, we're available to do, to take a look at those different designs and see whether it's feasible or not, so. Okay. So when you talk about the carrier putting the 5G service, is that only available then to the consumers that have Verizon? Or so if that's the case, then are they thinking about the multiple, these one utility pool that does have the multiple carrier because it's only accessible for the Verizon users and then AT&T puts it in, it's only accessible to the AT&T. Or is it accessible to all of us regardless of the carrier that you have? It's going to be carrier specific. It is carrier. Yeah. So, it seems, seems like thinking five years down the road that these polls will want to have all these cameras. It's no, it's no different. I mean, you see all the television commercials, right? It's no different than that. They're going to be able to say, you know, whatever. T, I don't want to be Verizon. And, you know, I, could, I want to be agnostic to all the carriers, but you know, Sprint's going to say we're we're way ahead of five G. You know, <laughs> in some areas, even today, right? I was I was just up in Cape Cod a couple weeks ago where I got very scant Verizon service, right? Um, and um, so even today, the carriers can say, you know, so they're, they're all going to, it's going to be a race for them to, to all, to be the provider of choice because they're going to have the technology in front of the other. Uh, uh, Ed? Is this line of sight transmission, if you, if you put up a tower, it's, it's range is a thousand feet. If you put up a building or trees grow between that and the receiver, does that affect? It is line of sight. And it's only a thousand feet. That's so. It's not, you know. Yes, you're not. If you put a tree up next to it, 
you can certainly you may have problems on that. So the community that. has to consider that. Yeah. Uh, later on. Well, basically the carrier has to consider that. The communities is the community the puts up a building. That's the, the carrier's, carrier's problem. I mean, you can't, you can't write an ordinance. I mean, I guess you could write an ordinance to the carrier that, that prohibits. Uh, you know, that's, but that would be ridiculous to write an ordinance to prohibit any building or trees around the carrier. Well, I mean, you're, you're basically doing the carrier a favor at that point, right? Not the community. Most of these were the right of way. And there aren't too many buildings going to be built the right of way. Right. Okay. I, yeah, I, I want to keep coming back to right, it, it, why is 5G, why is Verizon, T Mobile, whatever, why is it here? Why are we rolling it out? We're the ones requiring it, right? I mean, we're the ones that expect the technology to keep getting better. So we're the consumers. So it's not, you know, they're not doing it in force month. We're the ones demanding it. Um, you know, we're demanding all these things. Uh, we don't want latency. We want to be able to stream a movie um, very, very quickly. We want to have autonomous, you know, whatever. But we're driving the technology, right? So we have to always keep that in mind. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, just for general knowledge in this region, Right now, you have Verizon and AT&T purchasing poles directly through a, <coughs> a, uh, a, a a different firm, development firm, a consulting firm, to deploy. And then you have companies like Crown Castle that are also purchasing poles and deploying them on behalf of the carriers. Crown Castle works for itself. Crown Castle typically purchases property structures and then rents it out to the carriers. That's traditionally the model of the macro cell tower. Is that right, Joe? What's changed with small cell is the carriers are starting to purchase poles and deploy themselves without those control models. So you have a mix of different things coming to you. I don't think you're going to, for now, see a carrier come directly to your municipality. It's going to be through a consultant or a third party that's working for them. Right. Talk a lot about the above ground and you know, the aesthetics of the antennas and everything else. What, how are all these interconnected, and how disruptive would that infrastructure will all be from a subsurface perspective? Like, I don't know how. I mean, maybe a dumb question. I don't know how they're how this technology works. Is it connected with fiber? Fiber, 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 fiber. What makes 5G different than everything else is every 5G antenna is connected to fiber. So. You know, all those small cell poles we show you is at the base of the pole, it's all connected to a fiber, fiber feed that's hardwired to the pole. That's what gets you your, your speed. But is that, that's a subsurface? That's a subsurface thing that has to be done. So it's, it's a lot more than just what's above be. the surface. It, it can be. In an, a suburban environment, utilities are probably going to be on the pole, from pole to pole. There's going to be another line installed. In, in urban environments, it might be underground, or in, in okay. newer suburban contexts where the utilities are underground. But it could be either way. Yeah, you talk about new technology deployment. So we just had a presentation by a company that, that just came to be for micro trenching, right? So they've got this technology that they can run down at, you know streets in Westchester. They do a couple thousand feet a day in a micro trench um, very, very quickly. It, it backfills and it seals itself up, and they can you know they can install fibers like that. So again, these are these are companies that are getting that are right on top of the technology and the deployment of the technology. I mean, yeah, in terms of fiber now, we're hearing technology like microfiber, too. So where the fiber is a lot smaller than it was before, and you can get more, more fiber into a, into a bundle. Dave, <laughs> hey, you mentioned two words, franchise fee and, and annual fee. <laughs> um, so as these are rolled out, can a municipality require a franchise fee from them, or do they fall under an existing franchise fee that's already out there? That's a very good question. I actually don't know the answer to that question. My, my guess would be it's the latter. But this, yeah, the, the state probably has set up the franchise fees. So the, 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 the actual percentage of revenue coming into the carrier that needs to go back to the municipality. Then we use the other word. You use an annual fee. Yes. For antenna, yeah. And then on a separate note. Is there something the municipality should be asking for? As these are rolled out, should we be asking for some like, free bandwidth to be used as, as the as the you know, autonomous vehicle technology starts to roll out? And as we have our traffic signals, we're trying to upgrade our traffic signals, get smarter, and they need to communicate. Should we be asking for you know, a dedicated channel 
for our future traffic signal use on Connors View? I, I don't know if anyone else knows. Good question. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, right now, the, there's the problem I think with that is what, what channel do you ask for? Yeah. There's the technology that you want the channel for is just developing right now. So at this point, we don't we don't know what channel to ask for. The traffic signals already are already connected without small cell technology. So we already have connected traffic signals to each other without Some that technology. Not all, of them. not all of them, but the technology is already there without small right. cell to do that. And typically, I we can do it with cell, but then you're going to pay that company the recurring fee. You're basically having a cell service to your traffic signal. Hence the ask, you know, to get this built into an agreement. I, think, yeah. I mean, I think the question's worth asking, right? So. I think, it, yeah, it's definitely worth exploring. I mean, because as a municipality, when PennDOT turns over those connected signals to you, you're responsible for maintaining those signals. So if the connection between signals breaks down, you have to maintain that. If you're able to cut a deal where you're getting free cell service to connect all your signals together, that, that's a great benefit to, to the municipality. Not only that, but the maintenance of that cell signal is on somebody else, not, not the municipality. And then I, I also want to talk about, you know, you have to also think about co-located poles where you're sharing with a traffic signal or a lighting structure. Who's responsible for maintaining that structure after a piece of small cell is put on top of it? Are you going to share the responsibility with the provider? Are you going to take the responsibility of the provider, charge a fee for it? Or are you going to tell them it's their problem? Philadelphia's approach is it's their problem. Once they take a pole or put a new pole up with small cell equipment, everything belongs 100% to that provider at this point. It's their job to maintain it. If a street light goes out on it, it's their street light now. It's not Philadelphia's. I know those details. I don't know the details of how Philadelphia's going to enforce that. Because the problem with Philadelphia is the complaint that the street light is out is not going to go to AT&T. It's going to be Philadelphia that's called first. So I, I don't know the details of the enforcement of that. So with that, because I always love to leave on homework. <laughs> but I know that we're coming towards that magical hour. Um, let's give our, our panel a round of applause. So they'll be here for uh, for a few minutes afterwards. Um, you guys don't know this, but we're actually going to do a little video here, having some additional conversation. It'll all work out well. Um, but with that said, too, where that our video will be posted in the video of this and videos of our past uh, programming, we now have a YouTube channel. So again, as we send out information, please look for that YouTube channel. You can see some of the projects we've been working on. Uh, the uh, parking protected bike lane demonstration that we did in Westchester is up on that. Uh, parking day in Westchester is on that, as well as our, our past meetings. So you gentlemen can have a seat. I'll stand up here. Thank you. Um, I do have um, that I will send out. Um, Qualcomm did a great PowerPoint presentation. It's really, really technical. I understand some of it, but it kind of runs through the threads. I will give that, um, that information to you. Um, with Qualcomm, I've been told that in Chester County, there has been some work with autonomous vehicles that they're already maneuvering through the county. That's what I've just heard. I have not had the direct uh, uh, the, the direct uh, uh, visual of that, but that's what I heard. Um, and then the last piece from me before I turn it over to Nate is that our next event is actually our seventh annual Holiday Veterans Gift Drive. So we have done this. Uh, we work with our craft. We collect uh, items. Uh, that's posted on our website. We do have a couple of sheets here. There are boxes downstairs if you want to take one for your office. Um, we collect uh, gifts unwrapped, um, and those are then, we collect them and we move them all to the VA hospital. And for those vets that are making a transition from, uh, from the hospital or from homelessness into their apartment, we try to provide enough items in them to furnish that apartment. So think about all the things that you needed to go to your, uh, to your first dorm room or your first apartment. Those are the types of things that we're looking for. And with that, Nate, it's all yours. Sure. Thanks. Uh, for those that don't, don't know me, I'm Nate Klein with Pannoni. I have the pleasure of being the chairman of TMAC currently. Uh, Tim asked me to always close these events with a couple quick comments. 
Uh, first, I just want to say thank you again to, to Joe, who I have the pleasure of working with every day in Westchester, Gary, and which I think is nice that you don't see everywhere. Um, and then also everybody that's here. Um, I think it was on the back of one of these flyers on our tables here, where again, we've got a county commissioner, we've got engineers, we've got attorneys, municipal attorneys, land planners, contractors. So a nice diverse mix of people here to kind of interchange on those ideas. So just please take a look uh, you know, with your staff looking into 2020 at sponsoring TMAC, becoming a member of TMAC. Again, run a lot of great events. Tim and his staff do a very nice job and hopefully look forward to seeing you guys at more events in the near future. And thanks for running a timely event this morning and we'll let everybody get back to, uh, back to work. Thank you.